God, I just thank you for what you're going to do this week. Like, we have a great expectation of what you are going to do in, in and through the lives of these children who come, in and through the lives of the families. Father God, Pastor Wallover said, we have a bag full of endless seeds that are just being poured out. Father God, let us do that this week. Let us just have hearts for you, Lord. Let us just be a light for you, Jesus. Father, I just ask that you just be with every volunteer this week. Father, I know when you go and move that Satan just wants to just discourage and just keep us off track. And Father God, anything that comes against them, we just stand right now in the authority of your name that you will put a shield of protection around them. That Father God, that um, you will just be with them each day as they come, that when the world comes against them, but Father God, they're going to rest in your peace. I just thank you, Lord, for the word that you have given me today. I just ask, as always, Lord, let it be a seed that grows deep roots. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I am in college, for those of you who do not know, and I only have four more classes, praise God. So yes, thank God. I'm going to go for my master's because I told my kids I want them to call me Master Mommy. So, <laughs> and then Dr. Summer. So, and I will make them call me that. That's not a joke. I already told them it's for real. So um, anyways, I have two more classes left, or sorry, four classes left. I'm in two classes now, one being history class. And and so I can't get enough from it. I think maybe, um, and I'm not downing public schools at all, but I think I heard the public school version. And so this is the first time that I'm learning, like, the real version, you know. And so it is like, oh, my gosh, I'm, like, writing papers. Like, I cannot wait to write this, and I can't wait to dig deeper. It is just um, a whole new way of looking at the way that our country was started. Um, and learning history from a Christian perspective. So I just want to give you a quick history lesson So uh, that I have learned. So in the early 1600s, when uh, settlements like Jamestown and Plymouth were here in America, there were two types of people who started it. First, there are the separatists, who, and you guys know them. Those are the pilgrims, just so you know, uh, if you got that public school education like me. So basically, they believed that the church and government were to be separated. Good job, guys. And then uh, the group that I would like to focus on are the Puritans. And they believed that church and government could coexist. And their goals were to come over and create a pure church. And their goal was to have a church free of Catholicism. But in re they related it to Moses and the Israelites. Like, we are here and we're taking a pilgrim pilgrimage over. And we know that we are headed to the promised land. And so that's their mentality. And their motto was a city on a hill. They wanted to be a city on a hill. They wanted to be a beacon of light, not just for um, the Indians and teaching them about Christianity, but also for other churches. As an example, as other churches, as America grows, they wanted to show them how a pure church could be. They wanted it to be a foundation for other churches. So when, as a Puritan church and um, settlements operated, when you are an active member of the church, you get to have a vote and a say. So when something happens with land or something happens like whatever, whatever if, when you're in the church, you get a say so and a vote. Um, but as generations came through, they became less and less active, like the chil their children and grandchildren and all that um, became less active. Uh, active in the church. So they might have grown up in the church and maybe got baptized and take communion, but they weren't, like their hearts weren't in it. Like they were just showed up, right? And uh, they that really created a problem because when you have church and government and you want them to be together, but then they're not really in the church, then that's a problem. So what did the church do? They conformed. They said, you know what? Basically, as long as you just kind of show up to church, we're going to create this thing called the halfway covenant. So the halfway covenant is you could kind of sort of be like in church, but you still kind of get a vote in government. So that way it could kind of coexist, right? And so um, historians said, as I'm going through this and studying it, it said that when the Puritans disappeared, 
so did Christianity and religion. Like all of that hard work that they tried to do when they came over, it disappeared. So if we fast forward some time later, what do you have? Does anybody know? The great enlightenment. So it's a generation tired of going through the motions and halfway religion, and they wanted a real, impactful, tangible relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, so can I give you my whole four weeks in history class opinion of the matter? And this is big. The Puritans were so focused on the mission, they forgot who was watching them. And before they knew it, they lost generation after generation after generation. They conformed and they lost their legacy. Just let that soak in for a few minutes because that got me as I've been writing papers and founding fathers and all of those things. My heart just keeps going back to the Puritans who were so focused on the mission that they forgot their legacy. And can I also say that I think that God knew that this was a problem. He knew. If we go to Deuteronomy 11, 1 through 7, it says, You must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements and decrees and regulations and commands. Keep in mind that I am not talking now to your children who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord your God or seen his greatness and his strong hand and powerful arm. They did not see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed in Egypt against Pharaoh and all of the land. They didn't see what the Lord did to the armies of Egypt, to their horses and chariots. How he drowned them in the Red Sea as they were chasing you. He destroyed them and they have not recovered to this very day. Your children didn't see how the Lord cared for you in the wilderness until you arrived here. They did not see what he did. And I was supposed to Google how to say these names. Uh, Dathan and Abram and the sons of Elab and the descendants of Reuben. When the earth opened its mouth in the Israelite camp and swallowed them, along with their households and their tents and every living thing that belonged to them. But you have seen the Lord perform all of these mighty deeds with your own eyes. The next generation will never know the struggle the Israelites went through. They will never know what it was like to be in slavery, backbreaking work, they will never know the plagues of water turning into blood, flies, gnats, or frogs. The fear of leaving what was familiar to them and going to a place that they never knew. Trusting God to part that Red Sea and walking through it. Heading to the promised land in the opposition. My kids will never know the struggle I went through. But they will tell you that I tell them all of the time. I constantly tell my kids what it was like being the oldest, eating beans and rice for dinner every night. I tell them the struggle it was of being a drug addict and not being able to find, I was trying to find love and drugs and boys and all of that. I tell them that. I want them to know that hashtag, the struggle is real. Okay, they will never know what that was like right? They will never know what it was like to be through it, but they will know what I went through by my testimony. But even more so, they will know a faithful God. They will know a faithful God. They will know to trust him when everything gets tough and hard because I share with my kids every day. And this was God's word to the, Isra to the Israelites. Tell them what you went through. Let them know what you went through. Verse 18 through 17, and we're not, it's not on there, Eric, don't freak, um, talks about God's blessing that will be poured out to the Israelites when they obey. The land flowing with milk and honey, all they want to eat, enough pastures for their livestock and them. And then if we go through verses 18 um, through 21, well, I guess I am going to read it. Okay. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. 
Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when they are at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the skies remain above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. He says to teach your children. Talk to your children day and night. Put it on your door frames. It says bind it on your hands. You know what that means? Action. How about bind it on your foreheads and your mind? It means have them know the truth. If we do not train up our children, who will? So God also has a promise in there. He says on verse 21, so as long as the skies remain above the earth and your children may flourish in the land, he, the, he will, the Lord will sw- swore to give to your ancestors. So he swears that he will give them to them and their ancestors. God is telling them, look behind you. Look at their legacy. Tell them about your testimony, your struggles, and your faith. It's an action. It's an action. There are people who are looking at you and up to you. One of the things that Pastor Wolliver said last week, if we look at Acts 1 through 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling them about me everywhere I go, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have a job. We have, God has commissioned us. We have a job to be witnesses and go out and tell people. You all have a calling on your life, whether it be in your families, in your work, in your home. Amen? We have a calling. We have work to do. The Puritans, they had a job to do. It was a hard job that they had coming over to America and putting complete faith and trust in God, right? But don't be like the Puritans who didn't look behind them. Because even though we all have this great job and this great work and this great calling, we also have a legacy right behind us. Can I tell you that this is what saved me? This is what got me to accept Christ into my life because I remember being a little punk kid. I wasn't a kid. I was more of an adult. And... Spaghetti string tank top and short shorts, smoking cigarettes in the pastor's yard, cussing, saying to her, blah, 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 this and blah, 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 that. And she said, you know what, Summer? She goes, you keep telling me you want a better life for your kids. She said, look at it as like a canoe. You're in the canoe and you're going down the river. She says, here's your grandma who's an alcoholic. Here's your mom who deals with addiction. Here you are with addiction, and you have all these kids. At the time, I think I only had two kids right behind me. And she said, you know what? It's going to be the hardest job for you to get in that canoe and go the other way, to turn that boat around. She goes, but guess what? Who's sitting right behind you? At that time, Kimberly and Allison, now Noah and Micah. And guess what they're going to do? It's going to make my job a little bit easier, right, when they start rowing in that same direction. And how about their kids when they're in that boat and they're rowing and we're all going in the same direction? Don't you think that boat is going to go a little bit smoother down the river? She said that to me, and it changed my life. I said, I want Jesus right now. What do I got to (laughs) do? What do I got to do? How do I got to turn this boat around? Because I don't want my kids to go through that. I don't want my kids to know that. I don't want them to go through the pain that I went through, the heartaches I went through, let them run into drugs and alcohol and not to the Savior. I don't want that for my kids, right? That's where Genesis 50, 20 comes in through 21. I shared this with you the last time I preached, and I stand by it every day. This is what keeps me going, Every this verse that God just gave to my heart in the middle of a pit. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good, everything. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Do not be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. He reassured them 
because he speaks so kindly to me. This is not only where I get my, where I, what led me to my salvation, I should say, but this is where my heart and my passion and my calling are. That's why I love my man, because he's right there with me, right? We have a generation of teenagers who are hurting. Can I tell you what makes our youth group so cool? They are so cool. Can everybody say, your teens are cool? They are so cool, because majority of them are not church kids. And I have church kids, and I love them. But majority of them are not. Do you know majority of their kids, the kids that come to our youth group, their moms drop them off. Eric and I go and pick them up. Majority of our teenagers, it's not because their family goes. It's because they want to be here. That's amazing. It's because they want to be here. They come here because they want to. Right? I love that about our youth group. And we have kids who... Like I said, have pretty rough lives like I did, and yet they come to church because they want to hear our testimonies. They want to hear the word of God. They want to know what power is. They want to be saved, thank God, for youth camp and baptized, and they have that hunger. So three quick points I want to make, and then we all get to go to lunch. I'm so excited. I know where we're going today. Amen. Struggle's real for us women who never want to go every week, right? I'm like, I don't know, wherever you choose. And I don't feel like going there. So I know where I want to go. All right, principle number one. Three things I want to tell you. Number one, y'all, we got to have a hand up. I learned this right in the beginning of ministry. When I was first saved, um, the, we had a women's ministry at our church and 1,500 women Great big events every single month. Like I'm talking about we had a, a 10 people on a team and one person was in charge of the food and the programs and monthly speakers would come in and it would be these great big ordeals, right? And there was a girl in charge of it and the, the pastor's wife, one of the pastor's wives, and she they ended up leaving. And... Um, it was December. It was our great big Christmas tea. Like 500 women come to it. They dress up beautifully and all of that. And um, so she had left. And so it was just us team. And I was just, I wasn't on the team. I just was like, I'll come and set tables. And the speaker spoke and she said, um, said something. I don't even know what she said. But I just heard what the Holy Spirit said to me. And it was, you need to ask to go be in charge of the women's ministry. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Number one, I listed the million reasons why I was not qualified. I was just saved. I can't, I can't go there. I can't do that. And, like, you have to, like, know Jesus and memorize the Bible in order before you come up here and speak to anybody. And I'm not organized, and I have kids, and I'm trying to, like, be sober and married and all of that. Like, I just can't do that. And so for months, ta -ta -ta -ta, feeding, feeding, and it wouldn't stop. And so finally I just went up to the pastor's wife and I said, this is stupid, and you can say no, and I'm good with you saying no, but this is, it won't stop. Like, I feel like I got to tell you because the Holy Spirit won't stop. And so she came to me, and she's like, Summer, she's like, the Holy Spirit has been saying to me that somebody young in faith is going to take over this ministry, and I was going to lead and guide them through it and teach them. And I thought, Oh, well, that's so good, and okay, and since you heard it too, then we're on the same thing. I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was at that time, right? So I just said, the voice inside my head won't stop. Okay, so anyways, and she did. I had a hand up. She was there, and she, we met every week, and she poured into me, and I am so grateful for Rhonda Shea, who just built into my life and told me, like, how to just be a mom and how to be a disciple and how to follow fall in love with the word, right, and just go to Jesus and pray to him. She taught me how to mature, right, and just and feed on that meat of the word. And I'm thankful for Bobby Brecker who met with me weekly and who poured into my life. And she would teach, oh, my gosh, this lady just be like, Summer Labonte, you got to stop talking, and I need you to listen. <laughs> and she spoke hard truths into my life. I would sometimes leave there being like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And then I have to go back and be like, Bobby Brecker, you're the wisest person. How, how do I get more of that? So you have to have a hand up. 
Um, we need people in our lives to pour into us. There is a generation before us who have been through some things. Amen? There is wisdom to be sought after. I encourage you to find someone who is older in the faith, to learn from them, to read the Bible with them, to pray with them, and to do life together. We need people who are speaking into our lives and to hold it, to give us accountability. Number two, we got to have that hand down. So we have got to be speaking. We have got to be speaking into the next generation. This is where my heart and passion is. Let us not forget that we have the burden of responsibility to the generation behind us who need Jesus. I say this with boldness as I'm contemplating whether to say it, but I am saying it with boldness. We literally should have a waiting, a waiting list for people in kids' ministry and nursery. We should have a waiting list because you guys are so eager to be speaking into the lives of the kids. We should know their names. We should know their families, what they're going through. They are our legacy. We can build all the ministries and programs we want to, but if we don't have somebody going right behind us to, to build into it, then what do we have left? We have young adults and families and new believers in this room who don't know how to read a Bible. They don't even know where to start. We should be pouring into the next generation. Number three, this is your cue. You have a testimony to share. Regardless if you have been raised in church your entire life. Eric, I think I forgot to give you a scripture. I'm so sorry. Whether you have been raised in church your entire life or if you are just saved, you have a testimony to share. I love this verse in 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 13. It says, teach these things and insist that everyone should learn them. Do not let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all the believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. I love this. Ready? Until I get there. When's he coming? He's coming, right? Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. You have something to share. If God has redeemed you, you still got some things to learn. You are called to be a city on a hill. Did I have you do Matthew 5.14? Oh, I didn't. I'm so sorry. I got a Bible up here. I can flip to it. Uh, Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Just like the Puritans came over here and they wanted that pure church and they wanted, you know, an example to the Indians and to the other people around them. We have to be the same way. We have a testimony to share. You have something to give. Guess what? You're qualified. I know some people don't be like, well, I can't do it. Listen, I have said that a hundred times, and every time God says, I call the qualified, right? 